Hi teammates, this is Sean McCall. Welcome to the second part of my trilogy tonight. Um, really excited to have, have this one going on now. Um, as usual, we will breach themes on this show that are not common for European basketball or basketball in general. And that's why I'm really excited for this episode here as well. Before we begin, let me remind everybody to tap in at the bottom of your screen in the comment section if you think you've got a question you'd like to ask or also there at the, I think it's a question mark with a speech bubble. You can also ask your question and I will try to get your questions in as the broadcast is going on if I can find the time for it. So, as you know, I'm doing a triple episode tonight. The first one was really good. And this will be the second one. My, my guest for, for this one um, is a power couple. I'm glad, really glad to have them here um, to introduce a little bit of what we're going to talk about or part of what we're going to talk about. Everybody knows what a wag is, wives and girlfriends, right? Everybody knows they've got their own TV shows. They've got all kind of stuff. And normally it's, it's somewhat derogatory at times um, when you call a, a woman who's married to a male athlete or the girlfriend of a male athlete a wag because sometimes they're not seen in the best light. Um, but what we don't hear about is Habs, husbands and boyfriends. It's not very often that a woman is playing professional basketball overseas in, in Europe, wherever, and that their husband or their boyfriend travels with them. And I was thinking about that one night and I thought, man, that's a topic that nobody ever talks about. So um, that's why I wanted to, to, to to, to talk about it, and I was lucky, really lucky, um, that when I had the idea for this this episode, that I found a basketball player who was in that position. So Mariana Tolo is a professional basketball player in in France right now. Currently, she's reached the really pinnacle, the highest points of of her basketball career. She played in the WNBA. She's a two-time Olympian. Um, so I was really lucky to, to be able to reach out to her and, and find out um, if she would, and her, and her boyfriend, fiance, would be interested in joining me for this, this episode. Um, yeah, her fiance, Daniel Jackson, is also a, a basketball player in his own right who played professional many years in, in Australia. So it's, a, it's a, a really cool dynamic to have two basketball players that are together that have made this decision to go over to Europe together as well. Um, so let me get them in here. Except Mario. And let's see if it works. There we go. Thank you, you two, for coming on. Can you hear me and see me? We can't hear you. Uh, no? Hey. You hear nothing? Is it? Still nothing? Oh, it's no. just really quiet. It's like a phone call. Can okay. Speak? Can you hear me at all? A tiny bit. Okay, let me put on my Air AirPods. Maybe that helps. Hang on. We could hear you before, but now Can you it's hear me now better? Is, is, it, is it better now? It's like it's like it's a phone call, so it's really quiet. You know, we have to put it to our ear. Really? Um, Maybe we should try it again. I don't know why. Try yours. No, my, my phone sucks. But it works. Wow. Oh, that's terrible. Never had this before. Let's see. Sorry. No problem. Can you look up? I don't know. See. So you turn it off. Hello. I can hear you guys fine. Okay, now they're gone and they sent another request, right? Okay, let's try it again. Oh, 
Okay, can you okay. hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. So, Perfect. So, um, before, before we begin, I, I want to thank you guys um, first for coming on, but also for the fact that I got to use uh, the song Minute Work, the song from, from Minute Work <laughs> Down Under in my promo. I can imagine that you guys are tired of that song, but... <laughs> That's not too bad. Um, it's a good song anyway, so it <laughs> makes me feel like <laughs> Okay. Um, so before we start the interview, I, I like to tell my viewers how we met. And it's a, it's a funny thing that, that, as I said before, as I was thinking about doing this, this kind of episode, um, I, I was on your agent's page and uh, you, were, you were hugging a, 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 a male figure. Oh, I don't know if you can hear me. Looks like something's gone. Wait, let's see what's going on. Hi to everyone that's joined. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, let's see. Looks like it just dropped the call. And this has never happened before. So she left. She wrote, she just lost Wi-Fi connection, damn technology. That is very Aussie sounding. <laughs> okay, so we're trying it again. Let's see if it works now. Let's keep it going. Okay. Okay. We're good? Yes, okay. good. So I was I was saying how, how we... I got even in touch with you, and that was um, because I saw you in your your agents on your agents um, page here on Instagram, and you were you were next to a guy, and I wrote your agent right away like, is that is that her boyfriend, right? And then um, Lauren at her agency she wrote me back she's like, no, that's not that's not her boyfriend, that's a sponsor or something like that, and I said, okay, do you, do you know if her boyfriend is there? Is, is there somebody, is there a significant other there? And she's like, actually, yeah. And then that's why that's how I got into contact with you because I wanted to ask you if you would like to be on the show for this this particular person. Yeah, yeah. we, <laughs> we were just talking like, I wonder how um, how you know knew that we were both over here together. And then, yeah, that yeah, makes see? sense. In, investigating the source. I'm trying my best. <laughs> So um, here's how the interview will go. I hope you guys can hear me fine. Um, we'll talk about each other, your, both of your, your backgrounds and, and, of course, the athletic side. And then, of course, I want to go into the, the part that's not so, so openly discussed. Um, that's why I'm really glad that Daniel agreed to join us. Daniel, I don't know what Mariana had to do to convince you to come on tonight. Um, but, um, if she had to twist her arm. But... I think you, um, she definitely needs to owe you dinner or something like that. Yeah, it'd be nice if she cooked dinner for a change because being over here, I'm the one that cooks every night from training and stuff. So it would be nice. It's about time so, I got wine and dined. So you, you, you heard it here first, Mario. It's time for you to do the whining and dining for Daniel for coming on for this interview. Yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> okay, cool. okay, so yeah, so like I said, we'll go into the, the other stuff, the, the athletic stuff, and go into the, the the part about Habs, um, which which I really am looking forward to. So, Mariana, um, you've pretty much experienced it all as a as a professional athlete, as a as a player. You play for the Australian national team. You've been to the Olympics twice. You have played in the WNBA. You're you're on a high level team in in France. Um, what was it like for you to transition to um, America from playing in Australia for so long and then transitioning to America to the WNBA and then also to Europe? Because I would imagine it's it's a, a, a different game everywhere. Yeah, it sure is. Um, I think the Australian basketball style is kind of good because it's a mix of both. Like... Mm -hmm. European and, and American styles of play. In America, I feel like it's definitely more skills-based, one-on-one, but it, it was hard and really hard in the sense that everyone was so skilled, so athletic, like 
rebounding was such a big challenge in the WNBA because everyone is so strong and athletic and can just pull in those boards big time and jump over you. And Mm -hmm. being a big player, kind of not used to that so much. So it was a a nice challenge to be able to work on my game in that sense in, in the States. And then coming to Europe, you know, the bigs here are so physical and strong. Um, it's definitely like uh, the refs let, let a lot go, especially in Euro League, Euro Cup, um, compared to the French League. So it changes even like game to game as well. So it's interesting. But Australian kind of style of basketball is definitely defense focused, up tempo. Um, but we also like to have a bit of strategy as well. Um, what Europe is really, I think, strategic and, and especially in France, I think they they kind of have a really solid game plan and, and what they want to do to go into each game and they're really focused on that as well and um, maybe a little less up-tempo from somewhere like Spain or, or the States. The States was definitely free-flowing, like, traditionally based basketball. So, yeah, it, it's cool to see different styles and then countries that I haven't played in Um, like the Asian style of basketball is different again, Um, the way they shoot and move the ball. Yeah, I think that's a really cool and special part about basketball is that everywhere is so different and can bring their own strengths and and, uh, weaknesses. Um, I mentioned before you're a two-time Olympian. Can you you explain to my viewers what it's like to walk into that stadium for the opening ceremonies like you're playing for your country you've got the flag on you've got the gear on and you're walking into that country or that that olympic stadium uh for the opening ceremony can you describe how what a proud moment that is for for an athlete yeah there's there's no prouder moment for me than representing your country and getting to wear australia on the front of your jersey and when you walk into the stadium, it's definitely a bit of nerves because there's so much history and uh, a legacy that you want to uphold and do your best for. And, and it's such a great opportunity that not many people will get to do. So it's really, really special and, and nerve wracking at the same time. But I think when you get to focus on the game and, and what your strategy is, that kind of just goes away. But definitely when you first walk into the stadium, that's when you get to realize like it's, it's special moment and a special thing to be able to represent your country and um Mm -hmm. you know especially at the olympics which for for me basketball the olympics is the pinnacle of the sport it's where you want to go you dream of when you're a kid you know and for someone to for for me i had that dream since i was in year five at school and so to be able (laughs) to do that was just unbelievable um it's crazy because you're, you're playing all over Europe right now. You played like, like home, you played in the WNBA, you played in the Olympics. Um, nobody, I think nobody dreams about, I'm going to go to practice and I'm going to go play over in Europe. I don't think that's anybody's real dream somehow, right? But the Olympics was that for you. Can you describe the moment when you knew that you, were, you guys were going to the Olympics and what that meant to you as, a, as a, a, an athlete? Yeah, well, um, like when I was in year five, I remember the teacher going around and asking us what we wanted to do when we were older. And I I remember saying, I want to play for Australia and I want to go to the Olympics. And, um, you know, for me, I had a bit of a tough time getting there as well. My first real shot at making the Olympics was before the London Olympics in 2012. And... When it came down to it, um, I'd done all the preparation before. I made the world championship team, you know, two years before. So I I knew I was in with a good shot. But then when it came down to it, I didn't make the team. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I didn't make the cut. And and that was really heartbreaking. And then actually, like, 11 months out from the next Olympics, which was Rio, I tore my ACL playing in the WNBA um, for the LA Cups just at the end of the season. So... I was in a kind of a dogfight just to get there, just to, you know, be able to make the team. And I ended up rehabbing and within, you know, I got back on the court eight and a half months and um, made the team to go to the Olympics. So for me, that was just like a really huge achievement and something so, so special. And 
yeah, I'm really proud of it. How did you decide to play over in Europe? Because if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, the Australian season runs almost like right after the European one. So are you technically like playing year round? No, so our Australian season normally goes the same time as the European one. It's it's a bit shorter. So mm -hmm. normally in Australia they play from like October through till February, March. Um and so it's kind of you choose one or the other. So mm -hmm. I went through the Australian Institute of Sport, mm -hmm. um, and that's where I first, you know, played WNBL and then ended up um, signing with Canberra Capitals after that and played four season with the Caps. And I kind of always, you know, I've got um, European heritage. My parents are from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I was comfortable with the idea of going and playing in Europe. I think it's a really far way away for a lot of Australians, you know, and we have quality league, especially these exactly. days um, in WNBL. Uh, and so for me, I always knew I kind of wanted to challenge myself and go live overseas and play in Europe and see what that was like. And I knew that, you know, the best of the best for the Australian Opals had done that. And so I kind of just wanted to be like them. And so, um, yeah, I made that choice probably when I was around 23 to come and I played for France, Aix-en-Provence. And it was actually great because it was the first chance I had to play fully professional basketball because before that, when I was playing in Australia, I was studying and working at the same time. And so it was so nice to, to come overseas and just be able to focus on basketball and it really elevated my game to a whole other level. Um, especially because of the number of games you play. And it's, it was, yeah, really, really cool. So um, to come over here in the first place, it was just the process of, you know, talking to my agent um, and then ha him having some contacts over here to, to find me a great situation. And there was a team that had, had eyes in Australia and had seen a few different Australian players through. And so, um, yeah, they asked if I wanted to come and, I grabbed the chance and came to X and then played for Borge the next two seasons and then, yeah, went back to Australia. You've only, in Europe, you've only played in France, right? Oh, sorry, I missed that. You're cutting uh, out a bit now. In, in, in Europe, you've only played in France, right? I played one season in Turkey as well. Okay. So in 2018, Dan actually came with me. Both of us went mm -hmm. to um, Turkey and I, I played over there for Kayseri. And um, unfortunately, it was during that season, we had the break for the European qualifiers. And so we had a national team camp in so, yeah. February. <laughs> to the national team camp and I did my other ACL at that camp um so yeah ended up cutting that sh season short just by the end as well and then, and then came back to australia to rehab okay uh let me swing the camera over to daniel let me get his his profile in here so daniel you are also no slouch when it comes to basketball um you also played over in in, in australia back home you were under under national under 19 national team player um you went to a prestigious academy, right, back home. And how was it for you to to go through the whole process and, and end up as a professional? How, how was that journey for you? Um, sorry, I missed the end of that question. How was it to what, sorry? How was that process for you? Oh, going through the process and stuff. Um, yeah, look, it's... The process for males is a bit more clear cut, I guess. Um, in Australia, the, the the best kids in in Australia, like you, everyone already or, always knows Patrick Mills, Joe Ingalls, guys like that, all go to the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, so the best in Australia, you go there, and from there you make a choice: you go to college or you uh, go pro straight away. Um, now I thought I was always going to go to college, um, but I um, pretty pretty bad knee issues uh, towards the end of my, or well, throughout my time at AIS and I, I just made a decision to 
uh, played professionally straight away rather than go to college just because I thought I wouldn't have the opportunity to play professionally. If I, if I went to college, I didn't know how long my knee would hold out. Um, so, yeah, I, I jumped straight to the NBL in Australia um, and, and played, I think it was four or five years with the Wollongong Hawks uh, in the Australian NBL, which was actually in town as well. So um, it was a pretty, pretty I guess, um, fairy tale kind of, kind of story for me. Um, but then coming to the end of that, I guess um, I was never really, like, I mean, I was good as a junior, but I was never really that good. Um, to continue playing professionally, I was always kind of an end of the bench guy. Um, so, so finished. I think it was about two thousand, I don't know, twelve, maybe two two thousand thirteen, fourteen, maybe. Um, so, stopped playing then. But then I still hung around and played second division in the Australia in Australia for a bit as well. You were you won a championship and was finals MVP, if I'm not mistaken, right? What was that? <laughs> The championship with the oh in, yeah yeah in the second division yeah yeah we in the uh, in opposition's home floor uh, knocked off the uh, the the t- hometown favourites so that was you know one of the highlights because second division in Australia is semi professional so most of the time you're playing with some with, you know with people that you've you've known for a long time and again I was playing for Illawarra which is my hometown so I grew up with a lot of the players that I was in that team with. So it certainly, you know, holds a special place in my memories uh, getting to win a championship, um, you know, with some of my best friends. Yeah, that's, that's always cool. I mean, especially when you, when you play with those guys for a long time and, and, and then you're able to, to reach the pinnacle of, of what that team can reach. So um, do you think, do you have any yeah. regrets? Do you have any regrets from your career? From my playing career? Um, I mean, no. I mean, not really. It's all, it's all. You always have those things where you look back and, like, I was, I guess, relatively natu- naturally talented as a junior. Um, and I mean, to be honest, I probably just didn't work hard enough. Like, I didn't put in the hours that you need to, to be able to be a really top flight player. I mean, I, I worked hard, um, but certainly, you know, I wouldn't be. It's I wouldn't have worked level. as hard. Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't have worked as hard as someone like a, a Paddy Mills who I went to the AIS with. So, um, I mean, you, you get out what you put in. Um, and then even like Mariana, I mean, I, to my career I did workouts and stuff with her and, um, you know, when I get tired, I stopped, whereas she gets tired and just, just works through it. And so um, I guess that's what makes it, that's the, what makes the difference between you know, you know, I was, I was a pro, no doubt about it, but it makes a difference between someone who represents their country and right. someone who kind of just hangs around for five years. Right. Um, so I assume your life changed dramatically when you guys met. Um, either one of you can answer this question. Uh, how did you guys meet and who hit on who first? <laughs> we met at the AIS, so we okay. were both there for basketball. Um, it was kind of when you're at the AIS, you don't really have time to meet anyone else that doesn't go to the AIS. So we, we were kind of, you know, around 18 um, and met there. And then, I mean, I probably hit on her first, if anyone can guess. Um, it seemed like more of my, my character than hers at the time. <laughs> Definitely, but I think I made the first move. <laughs> it was something to do with the glow and the dark stars in our room. We were, it was a bit of competition. I said mine were better, and he said no, mine are better. And come, come check them out. And it, and it all happened. Okay, okay, ain't nothing wrong with it. Taking the first move, ain't nothing wrong with it. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So was it, was it difficult for you guys? You guys were both playing, um, pursuing your dreams, but of course there were times where you, where you were apart. How difficult were, were those times when you had, had to be apart? Yeah, certainly they were really hard. Um, being, being a professional athlete can, can be quite lonely, I guess. Um, so, I mean, a normal person goes – goes home after training and spends time with their – well, goes home after work and spends time with their, their partner and that's kind of their escape and I guess we just didn't have that. Um, you know, you do the FaceTime and, and all that kind of stuff, um, but it's just kind of not the same, I guess. No. it's And it's tough and at the time, like, 
I thought I was coping and then it, it was like you're doing the best with what you have and, you know, you try and call each other as much as possible right. and then these little games like, oh, he's got to call me first or, you know, <laughs> dumb stuff that you end up with. It's just much harder by the distance and then, you know, when you when you get to live together and be together again, it, it's just completely different. It's so good. Um, and it's nice now that, like, you know, we've gone through those tough times and we know what, what that was like and we get to really enjoy being around each other all the time and I think, yeah, we don't take that for granted. Mm-hmm. Um, either one of you can answer this question or you can both answer it, but at what point for, did it did it come for Daniel where it was like, okay, Marion is gone, so I'm going to have to make that decision to go? Uh, well, to be honest, it wasn't really that hard because my career wasn't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and she obviously was. So from, from my point of view, like if I was, I don't know, like any other male athlete that was going over and playing for Barcelona or something like that, um, you know, we talk about a wag, so like, if she, my wives and girlfriends don't hesitate to go over with their with their partners, so exactly. I guess from my point of view, it was uh, certainly she was making a lot more money than what I could make as a professional mm-hmm. uh, in in Australia or you know anything at that time. So it just kind of made sense. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think like at the start we were both you know playing basketball, we understood, like, Dan wanted to do that with his life. I wanted to do, you know, explore those options, and that's kind of why we did the distance. And, yeah, it just came to a point where, um, you know, Dan wasn't playing anymore, and I was still I still wanted to play overseas, and we really didn't really want to do the distance anymore. It came to a point. Um, I'm so lucky and grateful that um, Dan did the, make the decision to do that because, you know, he could have said... No, where it could have, you know, said, well, well, why don't you just play Australia, um, which I have done before and I can do. But, yeah, I, I just feel um, lucky to have his support in this, definitely. Definitely. Daniel, it's a rather unconventional move, right, for, for a man to follow his woman. That's that's the truth. Um, did you get any pushback or or from family members or friends or anybody that was like, hey, man, what are you doing, man? Um, not really. I mean, yeah, I don't think so. I think the, the, the most pushback we ever kind of had was when uh, Marianne signed in Turkey. Um, so going to Turkey and living in Turkey, and th- this was at the time when the Syrian border was kind of really, really hot, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and not in the sense that we were near the border or anything, but that was the only time where anyone was kind of like, hold on, what are you doing? But in terms of going, coming over to to support her, I mean, the first in Turkey when I went over, I continued to work. Um, I worked in sports administration in Australia when I finished, when I finished playing. Um, so because I was still working, and then I think because everyone understood that Turkey was going to be, you know, everyone... Everyone can live for a year in France, right? Eat cheese, drink wine, and do all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> once you went to France, we kind of, kind of knew that would be easier to handle. But um, living in Turkey, which is uh, a lot harder to to communicate with people for an Australian anyway, certainly, um, it was just kind of a no brainer. I knew that. Well, I actually don't know if she would have gone to Turkey if I didn't go with her, um, and it was too good of an opportunity for her to pa- pass up. So. I mean, for me to be able to work while I was over there as well was a bonus, but it's, it's silly for, for someone to say no. Like, who's going to – who doesn't want to go and live in a different part of the world and see the sights? I mean, travel to for tourism, I mean, what's the difference for me at the moment? See it as a as a thing, and, and she's got a, a small window of time where she can play, as any professional athlete does. Um, so we've kind of always talked, like, play for as long as can, and then – uh, when she finishes playing, if I really st- feel strongly about going somewhere for work, um, she'll have to make some sacrifices there as well. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll have to cook dinner pretty soon, right? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> uh, Mariana, 
this is a, a, a weird question, but did anybody ever talk to you about A? What are you now, his sugar mama? Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. What did you say? I, I said a weird question, but did anybody ever approach you with coming at you sideways like, hey, what are you now, his sugar mama? What am I doing? Like, what am I thinking? Is that what no, no. I think? Yeah. It, no, no. If anyone, if anyone ever came to you sideways, like, like, what are you, his sugar mama? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> not really. I think everyone kind of gets it, and because we've been in this relationship for a long time, and um, everyone knows that it's a tough experience to be overseas and especially while you're by yourself. So I think it's kind of more encouraged and my family are really happy because they know that, you know, I'll be happier with Dan, Dan here with me. And right. um, yeah, I think they, everyone kind of is on board with it too. And his friends tease him and call me a sugar mama. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Daniel, man, I got to say, I'm really impressed with your candor and your support of your fiance now. I think it's incredible. I think it's, it's, it's not a, such a big topic, but I find you very refreshing and open. And I really, really appreciate that. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, no dramas. I mean, again, if, if the shoe was on the other foot and I was playing, no one would bat an eyelid. Um, that she was over with me. So I just don't see that it's been different. And, and then I saw you led the show uh, with the term WAGS um, and, that, you know, some people get offended by that. I've got a group group chat with some friends at home who are also uh, you know, wives and husbands and stuff of, of players and we call ourselves the WAGS. So I, I just don't see the difference. I don't, I don't see it. I mean, I'm not ashamed of it or anything like that. Um, yeah, there's no reason. You know, I, I get to live in a different country and, and, and do very little of it. I mean, <laughs> most, pe pe people can try and like pay me out or do whatever, but most people in my position would uh, take the opportunity in a, in a heartbeat. So Exactly, exactly. Um, I was listening to a snippet from my good friend Jory at uh, We Raw talking about the professional, women's professional game. And part of the in interview was about the double standards between women's basketball and men's basketball. And um, did you find it, Mariana, did you find it difficult for you to say, hey, I'm bringing my, my boyfriend, my fiance with me? Was there ever any pushback from a team that said, no, that's not how we do things? Or, um, I mean, the most difficult thing really is just to handle the visa situation or the, the for Dan to actually like be here with me. Um, uh, we got engaged this year and mm. so um, got a certificate to register our relationship in Australia. We're a civil partnership to make it easier um, so that Dan could be over here. I mean, it used to be easy because um, Dan had has a British passport, but okay. thanks to Brexit, <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that definitely was the case in Turkey where they're not as, um, you know, lenient with partnership. You kind of have to be married. So the club right. really helped us out there. Um, yeah, they, they were really helpful um, to get him over. So yeah, I think, I think there was never any really like pushback. Um, it's, Definitely has its challenges, like everything, though. Um, so, Mariana, what are your plans for your career? How much longer do you want to play? Because, of course, now you, you're both over 30, so you probably have lots of friends that are married already, having kids, things like that. I think it's probably really tough for a woman athlete to put her job in front of other needs or other decisions has that has that been yeah, an issue for you um no it's never kind of been an issue for me yet because i never really like i ha haven't 
wanted to have kids yet and and that sort of thing but um saying that i think i'll probably play like another two years and then um try to have kids and, and start a family we've talked about this like it, it's strange because i feel like i could still play for many many years mm -hmm. um i also want to have a family and i know to do that that i'm gonna have to take some time out and um you know and i'll really want to be involved in my kid's life and mm -hmm. and I think I don't think uh, I could play and have a kid at the same time um, for some reason I just think that it's so challenging and I admire the people that have been able to do that it's, it's pretty special you know I have a teammate in my team right now in France um, she just had a baby in January and she's trying to she's working her way back towards the end of this season um, she's been in practices with us and I don't know whether she's going to suit up or not, but she's looking great and phenomenal and I can't believe it. Um, Valerie Ann of uh, Vipasalic, uh, yeah, she's, she's great. And it's so inspirational to see people like that. And Abby Bishop, who in Australia, who took, took in her sister's baby and, you know, really pushed in the national team and the WNBL for, um, rights and and better conditions for parents with children. You know, it's mm. it's different. It's a different ball game for us in women's sport because yes. sometimes we're the primary caregivers, or you know, you have a young newborn who has to breastfeed. Like it's not exactly. it's not a simple thing that you have to do. And so um, I think sometimes yes, we do have to make sacrifices. In, in some ways, but then I'm, I'm also excited to start my life after sport. I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but, um, you know, I've been in this thing for such a long time and it's been an incredible journey, but, you know, I, I, I am actually happy to start moving on with my life too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I know you do um, camps called Standing Tall for Taller Girls, right? Yeah, I um, did did one this off season. I started it um, called Standing Tall, and it, it was a post player camp, a camp for bigs because I think um, these days, you know, posts don't get the same opportunities that and lessons and um, one on one time that I could have got as a junior as well from some phenomenal coaches. So. Yeah, I really uh, I like to work with some young post players and, and help them and, and try and show them some of the things that I've learned along the way too. Daniel, when you guys move back and you're finally settled back home, what's going to, what's going to be your next move? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I don't know is, is the answer. Uh, I've kind of just taken it as a wait and see approach. I mean, I mentioned before I worked – I worked in, in basketball administration in, in the, first of all, through the, the state, state basketball system in Australia, um, where it's, you know, you, it's, we've got states in Australia and each, each state has their own administration. So I, I worked for ACT. Um, and then from there I mo moved and I actually worked for a team that Mariana played for for a couple of years too, which is an interesting dynamic as well. So I was the operations manager for the Canberra Capitals. So... Um, I think I'd like to continue well if possible, I guess, just because, I mean, it's been my whole life. I can't really imagine not having something to do with it. Um, but, you know, yeah, I just don't know. I'll, I'll wait and see what opportunities are available to me. Maybe I can get my basketball uh, fixed through coaching or something like that. Um, he's a great coach. The, he's coached the under-18 level. Um, state teams and the kids love him there and he's really smart he's good good brain got a great right. basketball brain that's right yeah well you have to have a good brain when you're slow so <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the Aussie humor um, I, I've got, yeah I've, I've got a one of my favorite students I, I teach and one of my favorite students moved back to Australia a couple of years ago um, and so, hi, Amelie. I know she's going to be back in this with her family. And um, that's that awesome humor is, I, I love it. I, I just I just love it. <laughs> okay, so last yeah, question. You can't make fun of yourself. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> last question for Mariana. 
I know you uh, support the organization uh, Lifeline Canberra, Canberra, which is um, which is striving for more resilient and suicide-free uh, community. Can you talk about what you do with them for a second? Yeah, so um, I had a friend who worked for Lifeline Canberra and, um, you know, being a sports person, you're privileged in that you have a platform and the ability to influence some people. And so I was approached by them to, to be an ambassador for Lifeline. And, you know, I thought it was a great opportunity to try and do some good in the world, you know, and use my platform for something really positive and, um, Lifeline are a great organization and they really do save lives. Um, but the work they do is so challenging and it's expensive. It costs um, $32 to fund one life saving call. So, wow. like every donation and every kind of drive that they have and every, every, you know, um, fundraiser that they do is really, really important. And so, any way that I can help, I do. And, and yeah, they're, they're such a great organization, so friendly. They're always, you know, doing the right thing um, by the community. And, and so I couldn't say no and I had to jump on board. And so I've been doing that for the last couple of years and um, it's been so great. And, yeah, I really, really am happy to, to be their ambassador and, and helping to, you know, encourage people to support them as well because they don't have much government funding and, it, and it, a lot of it is from... Um, fundraisers and that sort of thing as well. That's a very noble, noble thing that you're doing. Uh, so that's it for the normal questions. Now I've got a couple of quick answer questions for both of you guys. Um, who wins one on one with you two? A one on one basketball game. Sorry, who, wins? <laughs> who wins a one on one basketball game between the two of you? Uh, right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely me. In, I'm pretty sure your... I won the last. <laughs> no, I, I mean I lost well once, and the the amount of times we played significantly dropped. Um, <laughs> it's it's funny. I always thought like I'd be able to. I'd always be able to win from the perimeter because I was kind of like a. I played it in the three a bit, and then I was a perimeter four for a bit. So I always thought that I'd be able to play in the perimeter. And beat her, but um, I think when we play, I'd probably lose more more in the perimeter than the um, just because like I'm not fast enough to put pressure on the ball defensively anymore. So she can just shoot it, and she's pretty like, like especially from my elbow, around, she just makes shots. So um, I can still hold my own in the post because she's given up some weight and stuff to me. So and I've still got a bit of length on her. So the post, I reckon I can still hold my own, um, but everything else I would 100% lose. Um, I always, I always like, you see comments on social media like, oh, I'd beat her one and all this kind of stuff. And I've played plenty of professional athletes one-on-one and I was a professional athlete. And for someone who plays local recreational basketball to think they'll beat a, a professional athlete at basketball is a complete joke. They're it's all insane. kidding them. It's insane. It's ridiculous. And I don't care how big, they have no idea. <laughs> No. Okay, uh, Daniel, you choose a male, and Mariana, you choose a female. The best Aussie basketball player is? The best, was that? Aussie. The best what? Australian basketball player ever. Uh, um, I mean, I got it. Uh, I think the best player, like the best player in, in, bas- in Australia's history has to be Lauren Jackson. Like she was... Yeah. Arguably the best yeah. player in the world for a while. Yeah. Um, so she was the best player. I think Australia's favourite player, and I think most people would answer, answer this the same these days, has to be Patrick Mills. Yeah. Uh, like Current he, player, he's my answer. Current yeah. it's Paddy Mills just because he's such a inspirational person and he does great work for the community and um, he's just such a, a, a cool mm-hmm. and lovely dude. And when he pulls on the green and gold, he is like <laughs> Superman. He somehow yeah. like becomes the best player in the world. Like it's unbelievable yeah. how he comes through his country. It's, it's it's putting on those colors. It's a different level of pride. Yeah, it, it means it means so much to him. Um, so like one one of those 
when when the when the Aussies won the bronze medal, like it was just everyone was so happy for him in Australia. Like he's just, I mean, you won't find um, many more popular people in Australia than Paddy Mills. So um, I think he's probably the favourite emotionally, but um, Lauren Jackson's certainly the best best basketball player Australia's ever produced. Yeah. Uh, who's the most competitive between the two of you? Who's more competitive? Yeah, probably her. <laughs> more competitive have been a better basketball player, right? We're <laughs> still competitive in everyday life. I don't know if you know the board game Catan, but um, we've been <laughs> playing it at the moment because we've played on the phone against each yeah. other. I don't have it here, like, app. And unfortunately, I'm losing <laughs> by four. So I'm on a task streak right now, but it is so competitive. We get so mad at each other, but it's still fun. Uh, everything's competitive. Now. Love it. Okay, last one. Uh, Mariano, who is the best player that you have faced in Europe? Um, I know I put you on the spot, but... No, no, that's a good question. I, when I played in um, in Borsch, I had the challenge of guarding Dewana Bonner a couple of times um, when she played in Russia, and she kind of she plays a guard in the WNBA, and so that was so challenging for me to play against her, and also Candice Parker. I think those two. Um, Obviously, WNBA players, but yeah, really, really tough to guard off the dribble. I mean, I'm a big as well, and so that's, that's challenging for me. But I think playing against Dewana Bonner especially improved my game a lot. It kind of just something clicked for me after playing against her and, um, you know, really helped my defensive game to grow. But I think the toughest player I've ever played against, oof, that's... That's, that's challenging. <laughs> you play against so many good players and exactly. it's hard. I mean, someone, Emma Meesman um, from Belgium, she's just so smart and crafty and can find a way to shoot past, um, dribble past you. Like, yeah, she, she's great as well. And I really I think she's awesome. So thank you. I want to thank you both for, for coming on and, and being a part of my show. And uh, I, like I said, I, I really appreciate the openness and the, the, the ability, ability to explain what you guys go through as a couple living in a, on a, in a foreign country, um, Daniel being, being away from home and following his woman while she does her job. And that's what I really wanted to get across to the, to the users or to the viewers, that, that it's not always easy and that there are decisions that need to be made. And it seems like you guys have done an excellent job of being able to balance the whole relationship, being apart, and now being now in France together as well. So I, I really take my hat off to you guys, and, and I really appreciate you guys coming on. No, th like, thanks for having us on as well, and especially for women's sport, I appreciate all um you know media and stuff that we can get and so thank you for opening people's eyes up to what the life of basketball is like yeah. and um getting behind the scenes a little appreciate that okay so you guys get out of here and mariana you've got dinner in the next couple days yep game day tomorrow big one it's been a while we didn't play last weekend so right. it's going to be nice to get on the court instead of training <laughs> So, and you owe him a, a Thanks. meal. And, and See you later. Special. Thank you. Thank you. See you. So, teammates, thank you for tuning in. I, I'm, I'm really happy with how that interview came out. Um, it was really refreshing to hear a point of view from, from Daniel and how he adjusted to coming over to Europe and living with his woman while she was pursuing her dream of professional basketball. And it's not very often, I think, that it's talked about that when men follow their spouse or their fiancé or their, their girlfriend um, to another country while they're pursuing their dreams. So I really appreciate the openness and the candor that they both provided. Um, incredible couple. I, I really had a good time with that Aussie 
uh, humor. And uh, yeah, so I will put all the links in the description for for the YouTube channel. So please give them both a follow, follow their team or follow Mariana's team or the Aussie, the, the Opals back home and make sure that you show some love to them and, and, and really let them know that you maybe saw the interview and you thought that what they what they had to say was great. If you would like to share this information to someone that you think might need to hear it, please do so. As usual, I do this to share information and give information from from a point of view that most people don't get to see very often. And I hope that someone out there can use this information. So that was part two of my trilogy for tonight with these interviews. I am back on in roughly 14 minutes. Uh, no, less, 11 minutes. No, nine minutes. Nine minutes, I'll be back. And uh, with part three of this trilogy, thank you for tuning in. And if you didn't see it, don't worry, it'll be if you didn't see it live, don't worry, it'll be on the YouTube channel probably tomorrow. Thank you. See you later. Put it out.